Dr. Rita Ma'am is actually uh, passed out from the BJ Medical College. So she has started her career in medicine from Pune. She started all the way back in 1985, after which she went ahead to do her residencies at the Institute, at the Rehabilitation Institute in Chicago, as well as the Columbus Cabrini Medical Center of Pediatrics in Illinois. Uh, she's also board certified for pediatric rehabilitation medicine hospice and palliative care medicine, as well as physical medicine and rehabilitation. She will be speaking with us here today uh, on a topic which is called Cradle to the G Grave, CP Care Across the Lifespan. Do uh, she's also noted for severe peer-reviewed journals, as well as chapters in peer-reviewed uh, textbooks in pediatrics and uh, rehabilitation. Uh, before we start, uh, I would like uh, Dr. Patwazan to come in and say a few words. All right, uh, so we'll have a word later. Ma'am, we can start with your lecture. Thank you so much. If I can invite you on stage. Thank you. A round of applause, please. Well, uh, thank you all for the invitation. It started out as a casual call. Uh, to my uh, colleague, Dr. Rajiv Joshi, and uh, very quickly uh, evolved into this invitation to speak to you um, and about a little bit about what I do. So I hear uh, that there's a larger audience online, so a uh, welcome, and I thank everyone uh, for your um, attention and uh, the time that you've made um, to hear my talk today. Um, I thought what I'd do is um, start out with um, how does this work with moving it forward? No, no. This one? Okay. Okay, that's good. So uh, to start out, um, I thought what I'd do is talk a little bit and kind of uh, lay for you an infrastructure talking about uh, some of the paradigm shifts that have occurred um, in the care of individuals with cerebral palsy uh, going from um, infancy into uh, adulthood. Um, in terms of disclosures, I have none. Um, I won't be talking about any uh, in investigative uh, or off-label use <clears throat> other than the use of, um, you know, mention a use for some of the specificity uh, medications. So starting out, um, you know, cerebral palsy is a lifelong disability and disability may increase with age and aging may actually occur earlier. Um, so there remains a need for an internationally acceptable definition um, of uh, cerebral palsy that'll work for both clinical as well as epidemiological research purposes. And most accepted is this modified uh, version of a definition by Bax that then an international group met in 2004 and then again in 2007. And I wanted to highlight some of the um, main uh, changes that they made, whoops, uh, which is that it's a group of permanent disorders of uh, development of movement and posture uh, caused by causing activity limitations. So there's an emphasis now on activity at moving away from just impairments. Um, and that it, it, cerebral palsy, as we all know, occurs by um, disturbances occurring in the developing uh, fetal or infant uh, brain. And the other part that this definition expanded to was to say that there, it is accompanied by disturbances um, that are associated, such as disturbances of perception, cognition, communication, behavior, epilepsy, um, and musculoskeletal problems. Can you make it smaller so it, the whole thing fits on the screen? Because it's cutting out. It's <laughs> not so some of the important questions as clinicians and clinical providers, you know, important questions that are posed in infancy, parents, the first question they'll ask is, will my child walk? In early childhood, it shifts to, will my child talk? Uh, later in childhood, it's, will my child learn? And in adolescence, the shift is now into will, what about friends, relationships? And as young adults, the focus now is can this person live independently and sustain it? What about sex? What about marriage? Um, and as they get to be older adults, the question is how long will I live? What kind of medical problems should I expect? 
and what can be done about them. So um, to help with this uh, process in terms of classifying uh, cerebral palsy, um, something that was very difficult early on was we had, it, it was difficult to compare cerebral palsy in one place versus another because the descriptions were not uniform. Um, and the classification initially was spastic, dyskinetic, ataxic, or mixed. There was diplegia, quadriplegia, hemiplegia, bilateral hemiplegia, et cetera. And then came um, in 1997, it was Palisano and his group who developed the GMFCS or the Gross Motor Functional Classification System. And that really changed the landscape quite a bit. It is now universally accepted as a motor class functional classification system in cerebral palsy. Um, and this combined with some of the older uh, classification systems um, and now classifying it as bilateral or unilateral for the diplegia, quadriplegia, which falls in the bilateral category and unilateral for the hemiplegia category, now helps you know, with the functional classification system in place and some of the newer um, other classifications that have it well developed such as the MAX, which is the manual ability classification system, the CFCS, which is the communication functional classification system, the EDAX, which is the eating, drinking, and um, uh, eating, drinking ability classification system. And then you have the VFCS, which is the visual function classification system. Um, we now are getting a broader perspective um, in terms of uh, cerebral palsy. And if you think about this now, if you have an individual and they, you say, oh, this person has spastic diplegic cerebral palsy, who's GMFCS level one, uh, max level uh, one, you know, CFCS level two, AD, EDAX level one, you kind of get a mental picture of what this individual is versus GMFCS level five, you know, EDAX level five, CFCS level five. You have a, you, you can get really now get a mental picture that's clearer about what the individual has. Um, there are associated conditions with cerebral palsy we talked about, right? And so pain, uh, intellectual disability are very uh, common in uh, people with cerebral palsy with 75% of patients reporting pain and 50% having intellectual disability. Uh, and you can see in there, there's orthopedic problems. Musculoskeletal problems are paramount in uh, people with cerebral palsy, particularly with the effects of growth um, on the child. Uh, there's other uh, disorders, sleep um, and behavioral disorders are also very common in uh, people with cerebral palsy. So um, the International Classification of Functioning, Disability and Health, initially the ICIDH and now called the ICF, uh, really provides an excellent framework to understanding any disease condition and its effect on the individual. Uh, and I really wanted to bring, bring this, many of you may already be familiar with it, uh, certainly here and out in the uh, larger audience. Uh, so pardon me if you're very familiar with it, but I wanted to highlight this uh, in the context of cerebral palsy because it really helps us understand the paradigm shift that's occurring in the care of cerebral palsy. Um, you can see that with this, you can have any uh, disease condition and then you look at what body structure or functional impairments there may be. And so this is where you may have your diplegia, hemiplegia, swallowing difficulties following, falling in there. And you can see how that then impacts activity um, and impairments in activity uh, along with barriers, environmental barriers or personal factors, motivational factors, psychosocial functioning may influence their ability to participate in society. And when you talk about any intervention, any surgical you know, um, procedure that you do, any intervention like botulinum toxin injections that you do, ultimately what's our goal? We're affecting, we're in, intervening at this level to change the impairment, but ultimately our goal is to see that that results in improved activity and improved participation. And you often hear and read about, you know, so-and-so treatments not as effective because your outcome measures may be measuring activity and participation and you don't see those changes, but that may be because of factors here and factors here that are influencing that. And so it's something that I think is important for us to keep in mind uh, when we're looking at an individual with cerebral palsy. Um, so this is uh, Sheila and I had the opportunity to meet her uh, when I'd gone on a recent uh, trip to uh, Kenya 
where we fit uh, over 350 uh, children and adults with assistive devices, including wheelchairs. And what we, with this girl, you know, she st stuck with me because she came in and was from a school for the disabled accompanied by her teacher and basically ne needing a wheelchair so she could be in class. And the teacher basically, you know, conveyed that this was a young girl who cognitively was really quite impaired, was not verbal, and um, didn't think that she was capable of learning very much. And, uh, you know, we had a donated wheelchair there that was clearly large for her. And with the help of local uh, carpenters who were part of the team um, there, that, you know, just built it up to be more supportive for her. And then uh, I asked the question of the carpenter whether he could make a tray for her and there she was. And very soon with just a little modification to the pencil um, to help you know, her hold it, um, she started copying her name down. And the teacher was quite shocked um, at her uh, ability you know, to uh, learn and do this. And she very quickly learned how to move that wheelchair you know, within a few minutes uh, was able to learn that. And that really conveyed that this girl was capable of a lot more than she'd been given credit for. Um, so I think it shows us that uh, there's plenty of opportunity for us to uh, improve the lives of um, our uh, people with cerebral palsy. Um, so when you, I, I just have this here to demonstrate uh, for you uh, when we are looking at um, the ICF, how it can be utilized for any condition. And in this case, um, I wanted to um, draw your attention to communication and you can see communication disorders too can uh, fit into this model. And uh, you can see how um, you can go from uh, an individual with cerebral palsy having difficulty with oral motor control, speech, language, and hearing deficits, having difficulty with the activity of communication, which is sending and receiving information um, and sharing information to convey one's thoughts and feelings. Um, and then that in turn uh, interferes with their ability to participate in the school and the community. Um, the other paradigm shifts that have occurred uh, in the care of individuals with cerebral palsy is in the area, there's been a lot of advances in the areas of prevention, early diagnosis, evidence-based care, um, and we're seeing increased survival with more adults with CP surviving. And so it's an opportunity for us to learn about uh, cerebral palsy to see what, what we can do in the pediatric world to help influence um, the, uh, their lives as adults. So what are some of the advances in prevention? Uh, some of the big ones are antenatal mag sulfate in uh, premature babies less than th the 30 weekers has resulted in a 30% drop in cerebral palsy. Antenatal steroids similarly has helped reduce uh, the morbidity associated with cerebral palsy. Um, and from a treatment perspective, in term neonatal encephalopathy, use of uh, therapeutic cooling or head cooling has resulted in a 15% drop in cerebral palsy. And now we've entered the world of genomics. Um, and as we are looking at brain injury biomarkers and advances in neuroimaging, uh, we can expect that there'll be further improvements uh, in our ability to uh, help prevent uh, CP. I wanted to spend a little time focusing on early diagnosis because I think this is one area where there's been a big shift in the care of cerebral palsy. And the one area here is with the advent of the general movements um, assay. That, was, that I think has been one of the biggest leaps in our uh, changing the accuracy of our ability to predict CP. And it altered the view that infants are neuro neurologically silent in the first year um, so the GMA and the Hammersmith Infant Neurologic Assessment have been very helpful in this regard. And you can make a diagnosis of CP as early as uh, three months, just looking at the pattern of spontaneous movements that a baby has and the activity levels that the baby has. So this is something I think as therapists, um, um, focusing on the G GMA and having some training in the GMA, I think will be really, really helpful uh, in that regard. Uh, looking at evidence-based care, there's certainly a lot of evidence to show that there's mer merit to early intervention. Um, and a big focus and paradigm shift has been away from doing uh, institution-based therapy to looking at how can we expand that 
to enhance the individual's activity and participation at home and in the community. Um, and in the therapy world, there's been a shift to patient-initiated problem solving or patient activation of their motor circuitry. So purposeful activity is what um, is really being uh, pushed now. And so the tra treatment modes have shifted to training or goal-based interventions, including home-based interventions. There's uh, constraint-induced movement therapy by manual training that have all been uh, shown to be very effective um, in uh, terms of um, treatment. Uh, spasticity dystonia treatments need needing supplementation uh, with therapy, the need for supplementation with therapy. Um, casting and splints, postural supports are all things for us to consider uh, in treatment. There's not been as much evidence now uh, for, for passive forms of patterning therapy. So I know we uh, there was a big focus um, some time ago on NDT and that's now the shift there has been to more active forms of NDT rather than passive NDT uh, in terms of uh, efficacy. Uh, and I know Saloni, you're here, so you can perhaps, you know, um, talk about that. I look forward to, you know, after the talk, hoping that we can have more of a discussion. Uh, and so look forward to questions in that regard. And Saloni, I'm hoping that you and Dr. Patwardhan will join in and do that. Um, so in terms of prevent, the other big shift is in terms of preventive management of musculoskeletal health bone health with vitamin D and bisphosphonates, hip and spine surveillance, early contracture management, and serial casting. Now, you know, in terms of bisphosphonates, yes, it helps with bone density, but I think it raises the question of how effective is that and what are we actually doing to the bone because, you know, that bone, it can be pretty brittle. So it's something for us to keep in mind. And I think the um, quest is still on for finding more effective treatments to enhance bone <laughs> density. So again, coming back to the important questions posed, you talked a little bit about, you know, um, infancy, early childhood, um, and, and what those are. And now I wanted to shift our focus to adults because this is an area that is just emerging in terms of care for CP. We've had more and more people surviving after cerebral uh, with cerebral palsy and going into uh, adulthood. Um, and in certain countries where um, their survival has improved and, the, and with pre better prevention techniques, their in, uh, the rates of CP have dropped. So for example, in Australia, uh, over the last 10 years, there's been a drop going from you know, 2.4 per thousand to 1.4 per thousand in terms of rates of CP. And now you have more of these, they're milder cases of CP and more surviving. And so I think we really need to be looking at what we're gonna be, how we're gonna be managing our adults with CP. So looking at aging uh, with a disability in the same context, um, you know, just wanting to uh, show you have impairments involving muscle, bone, limb, joint development, cognition, and then affecting walking, ADLs, communication, resulting in decreased participation activity if those are problematic. And you have barriers to healthcare that can influence it, then can influence their participation, social skills and mental health are other issues as well. So CP can really be a good model looking at pediatric onset disability and going into adulthood. It's the most common childhood onset physical disability. Um, worldwide, the uh, rate is about three per 1,000 births. Um, again, being non-progressive condition, people with milder cases can survive with a, almost a normal lifespan there. And in the US, we estimate there's about 500,000 adults with cerebral palsy. Um, so I, I think it forms a good, if we can do well with this, I think we will do well managing uh, adults with other kinds of pediatric onset disabilities as well. Uh, when you look at adults with CP, what's the most common? The most common problems reported are pain and fatigue. And then you have the problem of non-communicable diseases. So that's something that I think is just evolving where we're starting to understand that people with CP seem to show a functional decline early and they seem to be more prone uh, to developing non-communicable diseases like cardi cardiometabolic diseases, pulmonary diseases and musculoskeletal morbidity. And oftentimes may have uh, two or more uh, problems or multimorbidity associated. With these, they, they're associated with a decreased health-related quality of life. 
Um, and that then sets the stage for uh, thinking about their care with more of a palliative care um, model or approach as well. So at my institution, um, we have a research center, a cerebral palsy research center uh, directed towards adults uh, with cerebral palsy. Um, and this is the team. We have Mark, it's led by Mark Peterson and Dan Whitney and Dr. Hurwitz is our chair. Um, Dr. Warshawski is a psychologist um, doing a lot of the cognitive work. CP and our clinicians are uh, Dr. Hopla and Mary Schmidt. And I uh, thank them for, um, I reached out to them for some slides um, for this talk so that they uh, kindly shared with me. So many of the following slides are uh, from them. So um, we started an adult with uh, cerebral palsy clinic. So it was about 15 years ago uh, that we started to discuss the need for a coordinated cerebral palsy program. And we looked at uh, patients with CP who were being followed in our institution and found that um, their visits started to drop greatly starting in the mid teens and going into adulthood, there was significant attrition. And so we wondered why it raised the question, what happens to our adults with CP? Where are they receiving their care? And so I organized a focus group and we learned that the patients were feeling disenchanted. They were disillusioned and felt that our traditional uh, pediatric clinical care model, which at the time focused primarily on spasticity and contracture management and equipment needs primarily did not really uh, adequately address their needs. Um, so Dr. Hopla had just finished her residency and joined us to do a T32 research training program with a focus on adults with CP and then uh, took on uh, to developing uh, this clinic with an adult focus on adult medical issues, employment, higher education, and relationships in people with CP. Um, the clinic goals were to assess uh, pain since that's one of the most common uh, problems to screen for common associated conditions, look at education and community resources. So let's uh, take a look at a patient, a more typical uh, patient that you might see. This is David, he's a 31 year old man uh, with GMFCS level two CP, spastic, bi spastic bi bilateral diplegic CP from prematurity. I uh, had an intraventricular um, bleed. Um, he'd had a dorsal rhizotomy about 25 years ago and he kind of gets ongoing botulinum toxin injections. He's single, he's, says he has a girlfriend, works in a community center. Um, he's taking college courses and he says he exercises one to two times a week and doesn't seem very happy about that. Um, feeling like he could do more. He's really concerned um, that he's been having a lot of problems with chronic back and leg pain and is not able to do as much as he used to. And he feels like he's struggling with his schoolwork and it's just exhausting. He doesn't really have any other doctor, no primary care physician, and he's concerned about early aging. He feels like he's older than he should be, and he's not able to keep up well with his peers at all. So what is it that we can do in an adult uh, CP clinic for someone like him? I think uh, some of the things that you can do is screen for cardiovascular risk, um, you know, his blood pressure. You can see that he's already starting to show some uh, metabolic syndrome type picture with um, er early signs of um, blood pressure uh, being raised. Uh, physical activity is unsatisfactory there, one to two times a week or some physical activity, his lipids are um, you know, high with his total cholesterol, vitamin D levels on the low side, he's got mild to moderate constipation problems, and he's describing reduced interest in doing things and feeling down. Um, so he's starting to show a lot, you know, you can see that cerebral palsy is affecting him in multiple spheres in life. Um, so at our research center, I mean, what this highlights here is, and I wanna make this point, is when you look at an individual with CP, you look at him and, oops, sorry. Uh, if you look at him, you see that he looks pretty lean. He doesn't look overweight, doesn't look bad at all. His BMI is at the upper end of normal, but it's still in the normal range. But I wanna draw your attention um, to this. Let's see if I can pull it down. Want to draw your attention up here. If you look at that individual with CP and look at the body composition, it's very different here now. He looks lean, but his body fat is at the 90th percentile. And I think that is something for us to keep in mind because we're talking about early aging problems. We're talking about a lot of these health issues um, and it may relate to adiposity. 
um, as we know that results in inflammation and problems with um, you know health as a result. So. The other problem that you see um, in people like him is muscle attenuation. This is a scan looking at the iliopsoas muscle in a person with TP, and you also have the lumbar vertebrae. And you see that uh, people with uh, cerebral palsy have problems with muscle attenuation. So they uh, have less, uh, significantly less a psoas mass in cross-sectional area, and you look at their muscle density and that's low as well. And this was what Mark Peterson and his colleagues noted um, in um, our patients with CP. What this also shows is that when you look at them inside, um, this A is a person with cerebral palsy and B is more of a typically developing um, boy with the same tibial length. And what you see in a person with CP is that they have a lot of intramuscular, muscular, increased intramuscular fat. Um, and you have lower muscle density, increased intramuscular fat, and there's increased bone marrow fat as well. So um, the, these are found to have be associated then with um, lower bone uh, mineral density uh, as well, both trabecular and cortical bone. So this was looking at adults with CP and they found that those who had more visceral abdominal um, adipose tissue, visceral uh, adipose tissue, um, and subcutaneous adipose tissue that were increased had more muscle, muscle attenuation and they had more problems with trabecular and uh, cortical uh, demineralization. Uh, it was negatively uh, associated with cortical bone mineral density. Um, and so of course, you know, osteopenia and osteoporosis are uh, the other problems that you encounter, of course, in this uh, population and may have a correlation with that increased adiposity because that does uh, link up with lower vitamin D levels as well. The greater adipose uh, tissue there is, the lower the um, vitamin D levels were found to be as well. And uh, with the um, decrease in uh, bone mineral density, there's a higher risk for low trauma fractures. And what we found is that those people who have low trauma fractures had increased mortality risks as well. So critical question then uh, raised was given the documented loss and absence of lean body uh, mass uh, and increased uh, storage of visceral and mus muscular adipose tissue, is there an increased risk for chronic diseases in CP? And what, whoops. and what they found was sure enough, yes, there were. When they looked at cardiometabolic risk, that's elevated. When you look at pulmonary risks with um, asthma, um, emphysema, et cetera, that was significant as well. And when you look at uh, problem, the musculoskeletal morbidity, looking at uh, osteoporosis, osteopenia, uh, joint problems, as well as uh, osteoarthritis, that is, and rheumatoid arthritis, um, they saw that there was definitely a correlation. And when you had reduced muscle lean body mass, increase in the visceral and muscular adipose tissue, there was an increased risk for chronic diseases in cerebral palsy. Um, so obesity and lack of physical activity were each independently associated with these chronic diseases. And you can see that with the musculoskeletal morbidity, the multimorbidity, that means having two or more problems um, relating to musculoskeletal health, it increased going, increased with age. As you got older, those problems got worse. Um, and again, this, this also went with a non when you looked at non-communicable diseases um, and multi-morbidity multi in adults with CP, it wasn't just relating to older adults. It was also true looking at young adults, 18 to 30 years, that we were seeing these problems early on. And what we found was that in hemiplegic patients, this started to occur around 57 years of age, but in patients who were bi bilaterally involved, this was in their 30s, in their mid-30s. So they were starting to show changes of aging occurring earlier uh, in people with CP.
So what about function? The literature suggests that about 25% or more of ambulant adults with cerebral palsy experience a gait decline. Um, and this is associated with older age, higher GMFCS levels. So of course, someone who's four and five is gonna show more of a decline than uh, patients who are GMFCS level one or two. But I wanna emphasize that it's the one in two population that we want to also focus on and ensure that they are maintaining their function because they could drop in function as well over time if they do not keep up with physical activity and physical conditioning. Bilateral impairment is associated with a greater chance of gait decline and higher uh, levels of pain and fatigue. So when you look at pain and fatigue in uh, CP, um, 54 to 70% of adults report significant pain monthly uh, to weekly. Um, and this uh, you know, pain can be pretty significant, affecting them primarily in their back, legs, and hips. Those are the most common. But I wanna draw your attention to one other problem, and this is something to be aware of in people with cerebral palsy, especially those with dyskinetic forms of CP, is that if they're complaining of neck pain, and if, they, if you also then notice that they're declining in function, you wanna pay close attention to that population because they could be developing cervical stenosis and cervical myelopathy that may require surgical uh, intervention. Uh, patients with CP may also have neuropathic pain and amplified musculoskeletal pain syndrome or centralized pain. Um, and this is true particularly of those children receiving multi-level surgery um, and some of the children where you find that they seem irritable and they're crying for, and you just cannot, it seems unrelenting and they're unable to control, it could be that they're having problems with visceral hyperalgesia as well. And your treatment modes are gonna be different for centralized pain versus peripheral or nociceptive pain. Uh, pain has significant impact on the quality of life of both the person and the caregiver and interferes with work and life 60% or more. Um, and the other thing to note is that pain may actually be underreported and undertreated in this population, particularly if they're a nonverbal population, cognitively impaired, you're relying on proxy reports and proxy measures rather than the person telling us themselves. Um, so I think it's something for us to be very aware of and trying to um, address in this population. So in terms of management of pain, I'd say the, what, something that's very important is try to identify the pain generator. Where is the source of pain? Is it muscle and fascia? Is it bone, is it joint, is it coming from the viscera? I think that's really important um, to try to spend some time in trying to address. Um, something that I found in our uh, patients with uh, CPs, particularly those getting spine surgery when they have fusion uh, and um, where they're going down to the pelvis is that they may have more complaints of pain in the low back area and it could be because of SI joint problems as a result. And so we found that it's been very helpful um, focusing on treatment, uh, targeting SI joint dysfunction, including use of steroid injections if need be. And that's been very effective. Uh, good nutrition, particularly targeting muscle mass, so protein, uh, bone health um, is important uh, in helping with this, as well as promoting aerobic physical activity. And that's sort of become the mantra for us in uh, terms of cerebral palsy care now, and particularly with adults, is promoting aerobic physical activity. Um, overall. Uh, promoting good sleep is really important. And then you have control of spasticity and dystonia. And this involves treatments like botulinum toxin injections, intrathecal baclofen therapy for more regional uh, control of spasticity. Uh, phenol nerve blocks are something that are used and oftentimes in conjunction with the botulinum toxin injection so we can expand our uh, targets. Um, and then uh, oral medications, of course. Um, it's important to assess in terms of pain, it's important to also assess the need for surgical intervention if need be for palliation. So if you have someone who's got, if you have someone who's GMFCS level five, a non-ambulatory patient having a lot of problems and you've identified the pain source to be the hip, um, you know, that's something that may need to be looked at, especially if it's a dislocated hip with a lot of arthritic changes, um, would it be helpful to do a procedure like the girdle stone, for example? Um, in, in terms of, I mentioned earlier that uh, in people who've had musculoskeletal lengthening surgeries for contracture management in particular, 
that they may, that's a population that you worry about neuropathic pain um, because of neurovascular bundle stretch. And so you might consider a trial of a medication like gabapentin in that population, promote aerobic activity in that population, but also something that could be done pre the surgery is trying to see if measures like uh, botulinum toxin injections combined with serial casting might help extend that, stretch out that muscle some to reduce uh, stretch post surgery. Um, and like I said earlier, one of the biggest challenges with people with uh, neurologic impairments in assessing pain is how do you assess pain? And so that's where there's been a lot of work going towards trying to identify some tools that may help us. And a big part of assessing pain in severely neurologically impaired patients is um, in terms of behaviors. So observing their behaviors for pain behaviors um, and using a scale like the uh, FLAC, which is a revised, um, a revised scale looking at facial expression, looks at leg movement, looks at activity, cry, and consolability of the patient. In terms of sleep, sleep is again, very, very important. Um, poor sleep is common in neurologic syndromes and increasingly is being recognized as a problem in CP. It affects many aspects of health. Um, and it's very important to, um, you know, when you have someone who's having difficulties with sleep, you wanna ascertain, is this a problem due to G reflux, for example? Are they having a problem with nocturnal spasms that you might be able to address? Is there a problem with obstructive sleep apnea? that could be uh, treated if their tonsils and adenoids are enlarged. And you wanna be particularly aware of this when you're using medications for tone control, especially when you're using enteral med, um, meds like baclofen, either or enterally or intrathecally, because um, that's gonna lower your tone, takes away the spasticity, which may have been helpful. And when a person's asleep, everything relaxes back there and you may be aggravating a problem of obstruction. Mental health issues in CP, depression and anxiety are very common, and this may be related to decreased cause for decreased participation, um, certainly can be a factor with pain, sleep problems, and other neurologic factors. There's also a report of increased incidence of mood disorders like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia in people with CP. Um, and lastly, I would, it would be very remiss not to talk about um, constipation uh, in adults with CP. It is a very, very common problem uh, in people with CP and can be, uh, and working in the uh, palliative care world, I can say that we've encountered bowel failure to often be the start of the spiral down um, in terms of end of life. So um, it's certainly an area of, um, that, that often is forgotten, but can be a source of immense distress uh, to the patient, so it's important to address that. And we think about, you know, pain often, if they are then on opiates or other pain medications, then that can further slow the bowel down and cause problems as well. Um, so with the current interest in gut-brain connection, I think this is definitely an area for research in uh, CP. And um, so now kind of thinking about all of these different problems that you might encounter in people with cerebral palsy, the question is, what you know? How how do you approach them when certain problems get to be unrelenting? And this is where palliative care uh, came in to be. So I was working as a pediatric physiatrist, and I developed a focus on function and enhancing quality of life. And I was drawn to this emerging field of palliative care because it became very clear to me that parents and our treatment goals uh, as providers were sometimes not in line and that there needed to be a different approach. Um, there was one particular patient um, of mine with CP who had shunted hydrocephalus um, and a baclofen pump. Um, and he had done fine for years, but then suddenly began having uh, problems of recurrent shunt dysfunction. Um, his mother became increasingly distressed with each visit. And it was on one such visit where it became very clear that the treatments being offered were really increasing suffering, both for the patient and for the parent, and was interfering with their quality of life rather than improving it. And I uh, credit my nurse, my clinic nurse, with opening my, for uh, opening my eyes to a whole different way of thinking, because I had to take a step back and think about what am I actually doing here? 
you know, by offering different treatments? Am I helping this person? Because we can do a lot of things in medicine to the person. The question is, are you doing it for the person in any way? And so, uh, you know, it did uh, change how I started to view uh, care overall. Um, and so now when you, you know, think about um, are some of our patients, it's not everybody um, that needs to be, you know, have palliative care uh, involved um, in their care. When you think about palliative care and how you um, define it, it's basically to palliate is to ease symptoms, to reduce the burden of disease, to relieve suffering. It is not the same as hospice care. Palliative care is very big. Hospice care is a small you know, part of palliative care. Uh, hospice care is more end of life care, but not all palliative care is hospice care. And it involves a team approach. Um, there's three main domains that we assist in. One is symptom management, the relief of physical, psychological, um, uh, psychosocial, as well as spiritual suffering, uh, communication and coordination of care, because that can get very complex uh, for some of our patients uh, with CP, and support in me uh, medical decision making, uh, particularly when it gets to be complex decision making. And one such example might be you have a, severe, a person with severe CP, GMFCS level five, um, who's got progressive uh, scoliosis, you know, worsening uh, medical. Uh, situations, maybe worsening seizures. And the question is, what do you do about that? Do you intervene and, uh, you know, do spine surgery just because you can, or do you not? And that's a question and a discussion that I think that needs to occur. And then based on where the family values are, based on where, what the goals of treatment are, you can make a decision of, do you offer them that surgery or do you not? Um, but the goal definitely should be one of providing uh, comfort and providing good quality of life for them. So you kind of have to um, address that uh, with the family. So when is it that we get consulted? We get consulted uh, primarily when the patient is beginning to experience any of the following, where they have recurrent illness, frequent hospitalization, and or decline in health and daily quality of life. And one question that helps us um, discern that is asking a question, are you having more good days or bad days? And if the family, if the patient's able to say that, you know, or starts to say that I'm having increasing number of bad days, then pretty much most of my days are bad days, then it's telling you that what, where we are right now and with what treatments we're doing, it's not um, enough. It's not offering them enough comfort and we need to look at things differently uh, to provide them with care. Um, in addition, sometimes, as I said, when it comes to big decision-making, that's where um, we may need to get consulted. And something to keep in mind is that just because a treatment or a procedure can be done does not mean that it has to be done. Um, and so I think involving palliative care at the right time can help families and pro providers navigate when and how to proceed depending on the patient family values, the goals of care, and keeping their quality of life in the forefront. So what are some, what are some take home points from this? It's to start early with diagnosis and intervention. You wanna keep the uh, ICF in mind with primary goals of improving activity and participation, minimizing barriers and supporting psychosocial health. Um, adults with cerebral palsy have increased non-communicable disease morbidity and multimorbidity is also high as well as musculoskeletal morbidity is high. And what can help with that is exercise and healthy lifestyle, and we should promote this early, starting in childhood. Um, we know that exercise, that some, of, some of the myths associated with exercise and spasticity is that if you exercise, you work on making the muscle stronger, you might actually worsen the spasticity, and that's not true. And you don't actually need necessarily need formal PT to be physically better, you need to be physically active to get physically better. I think what physical therapy does is help guide the individual, um, you know, in terms of getting started um, and helping them um, on get on the path of physical activity. Um, the other fear that people often have is, oh, if I work out, will I hurt myself? And I think that's where physical therapists can also come in handy, where they help show them correct ways of moving um, so that they're not uh, causing compensatory injuries. When you think about exercise and physical activity, um, you know, in terms of a prescription for it, pardon me, this slide is kind of busy, um, but what it basically is showing is that you wanna 
have exercise directed at uh, cardiorespiratory uh, or aerobic exercise. And so starting with one to two sessions per week and then gradually expanding to three or more sessions per week um, is important. You start at about 60% of peak heart rate and then gradually increase that duration being about 20 minutes initially, and then uh, keep in increasing. You wanna involve larger muscle groups and you wanna in, uh, alternate between continuous and rhythmic activity. Uh, you wanna balance this with the resistance training. Um, so, and doing that on non-consecutive days, two to four times a week will be very helpful. And then people with CP, because they have compensatory ways of moving, um, and uh, it, it is important that uh, when you're doing resistance exercise, that perhaps you start out with single joint exercise rather than multi-joint uh, type of exercise so that they don't injure themselves. Um, and what's recommended from a physical activity standpoint for us all, but definitely for people with CP, is one hour of moderate to uh, vigorous acti uh, activity five days a week. And you can break up if an individual is more sedentary, then you break up their sedentary activity so that every 30 to 60 minutes, they're doing two minutes of something that's active. Um, and that would be helpful. And that could be even playing a video game, which for someone with CP might be a big task in itself. Um, so in terms of a fact sheet, you can look at the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine. They have a nice uh, fact sheet on fi uh, physical fitness and exercise for adults with cerebral palsy. Um, and when we, uh, in terms of other resources, something I wanted to kind of spend a little time on is talking a little bit about how uh, our adults with CP clinic came to be and how it's structured. So we have a team, you need a team of people who are interested in the care of adults with CP. And typically the team might include someone from physical medicine and rehab, someone from orthopedics, neurosurgery um, and therapy. But you also need um, to have a social worker uh, involved um, to help and perhaps a dietitian if that's available. You wanna make sure you have the time um, to dedicate towards developing and providing this care. You wanna address uh, problems that lead to musculoskeletal deformities you want to address the uh, spasticity underlying tone problems that they are. Positioning is very important as well and looking at equipment. Uh, emphasize quality of life issues, not just physical functioning. And you want to keep that palliative care approach in mind. Um, the other thing I would say is very important is creating a registry to further research. And I just heard that you have a nice uh, registry here with over 1,200 um, people with children with cerebral palsy, Dr. Patwardhan, you were saying? So that, that's great, a good way to start. Um, and why do we do all this? We do it um, for our patients. So here uh, on the same trip, I met this 47 year old uh, woman who had essentially been bed bound, was living at home, taken care of by her father and had never been out of the house, really not been out of bed she, because she didn't have a wheelchair or any way to get around. Um, and you know, we managed to fit her in something, wasn't the best fit, but she was comfortable and uh, got a big smile on her face and said the first thing she wanted to do, she and her father wanted, to, her father said they wanted to do was go to church the next day. So that was going to be the family outing. Um, but this is why we do it. We, we do it to open doors and up opportunities. And it is my fervent hope that we continue to open doors for individuals such as her through the care we provide. Uh, I see just having, you know, my brief conversation with Saloni here and with Dr. Patwardhan, I think here at uh, Sanchepi, you have a tremendous opportunity uh, where you have pediatric and adult providers, um, you know, pretty much under the same roof, providing care for individuals. And you have the skill set to be able to provide care for and a seamless transition going from pediatric into the adult world for uh, people with uh, cerebral palsy. Um, so with that, I thank you and uh, I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you. Hopefully not everyone fell asleep and awake. <laughs> That's good. No, most are. That's good. Most are awake. Less uh, more fatigue and less muscle breaching can happen with CP. Is this something very similar to a sarcopenia which would occur in a person 70? Yes, actually, that's what they're, they, you know, there's different terms for this, um, you know, um, so we are seeing, it, it is very similar to the sarcopenia that one sees, and that's why we're talking about early aging um, occurring in people with CP, and it's felt um, due to this um, muscle 
infiltration with uh, fat, uh, increased adipose tissue in there. So very similar, not the same, but similar. So in terms of pal palliation, it's it, the program we have is we have a palliative care service. It's not geared specifically to people with CP. Um, it's at the hospital for adults with, you know, who need it. And then on the pediatric side, we have pediatric, you know, palliative care that's for all patients. Um, but what we find is that when you look at palliative care patients that are followed, you have different groups or different categories of patients. There are some who have progressive conditions, think conditions that are going to progressively get worse. Then you have others where there is the possibility of a cure, not necessarily, but they're pretty significant you know, problems like cancers where they could die, um, but there is the chance that there may be a cure. And then you, you have uh, some conditions where there is you know, no chance of cure, those are the progressive, and then you have conditions like CP where it's more of a static condition, but with the potential for something to get worse. So people with cere cerebral palsy are prone to seizures. You can have status epilepticus develop, and then as a result, the person can aspirate and you know, develop a bad pneumonia and they could die. So that could happen any time. Um, and so as a palliative care team, you know, we're certainly involved in, depending on what the situation is. But in terms of it being government funded, yeah. and, so uh, in yeah. so in terms of our institution, we have a special program that's uh, it's funded through the hospital, uh, primarily in terms of palliative care services. But we also have a program geared towards complex medical care, um, and that's actually started as a pilot program with uh, government funding called Partners for Children, and that involves more home-based palliative care. So it's where we have a group of nurse practitioners who will go visit these people. And the goal of the program is to see if we can reduce hospitalizations and hospital visits for this uh, population. For that program, it is. Uh, insurance is covering uh, palliative care in our state, yes. Because the challenge that we face is that cerebral palsy as a disease, including its manifestations as contractors or dislocation. In India, it is considered as pre-existing and no insurance covers it. So pretty much the parents have to spend for a disease which is non curable Right. We, so we there is a lot of hesitation in seeking out treatment and the government machinery is uh, sadly inefficient or not as skilled. So to start a palliative uh, CP center even for adolescent or adult is a highly labor intensive exercise and I would assume it will need a lot of funding because to get so many people working for that there has to be adequate funding for uh, you know I think so many people. I think a study of the evolution of how it developed there because it, when I started in palliative care, it was very similar. It was insurance companies were not really, you know, covering it very much unless it was more hospice care or end of life type of care. Um, and then it gradually evolved where they were able to show that involvement of palliative care early actually saved money uh, for the state, saved money for the hospital because it kept them away from, uh, you know, need for hospitalizations. And by showing that then, insurance companies started to pick up and do now, you know, cover it um, for, and in the pediatric world, it even covers, um, you can do what's called concurrent care. So someone can be receiving palliative care and can still be in the curative model, uh, like with cancers. So that does get covered. And then the medical insurance will pick up some parts in palliative care and the other insurance picks up the other parts. And how much of uh, you know, it's interesting. I, we've done a, a paper on complementary and alternative medicine in uh, cerebral palsy, and you know, it's pretty rampant uh, out there. I would say over the years, I we saw a peak about 15, 20 years ago. You know, with alternative medicine in uh, CP, I think a big one now um, is um, 
yep, th that we went through that, and that's sort of calming down now, I think. But the big one now is CBD oil, um, you know, and using that. And that has some merit to it in certain conditions, like uh, difficult to control seizures, you know, which happen to be in our population as well. And then you may see improvements in tone, um, you know, as a result. But in terms of complementary alternative medicine, I think um, definitely there people will try. You have a condition that doesn't have a cure, you know, you're going to be trying different parents are going to be trying in a lot of different things. And a large part of it is education of where they put the money. And so the more you can use evidence-based care to educate families about how to utilize their uh, finances more effectively, I think it'll be helpful. Um, I would say massage is one. In, in, when you look at alternative uh, therapies, alternative medicine, I would refer you to an article where it's a, systemic, a, a systematic review by Iona Novak. Um, definitely refer you to that article, which looks at um, um, what types of, look, just looks at evidence base behind all of the treatments that are often encountered in people with CP. And it did show, you know, I had a green light for massage, which has been shown to be effective, um, you know, quite well. So certain forms, I don't know if it necessarily falls in the alternative, it may be more mainstream here, you know, um, can be uh, helpful. Uh, we have other forms there that are question, questionable chiropractic treatment, you know, craniosacral therapy, um, that there isn't because, enough uh, evidence for. Practically, adult CP care in our country is uh, non existent. It's practically you hide away such a patient in the home, mm -hmm. or it's left to the family and the destiny. There is nothing like a societal uh, comprehensive program or care. For right. And I can tell you, you know, working uh, or being a member of the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy Development and Medicine and thinking back to when I started there and seeing the evolution over time, you know, I can tell you that one of the biggest changes that happened is when you got and we noticed it actually first in the world of autism, where there was a parent group that became very, very vocal and actually started became very vocal, became very active, organizing themselves and taking it up to the center, to the government, right. um, and really pushed it. And then there was a move at the American Academy of CP Developmental Medicine saying, hey, we ought to be organizing ourselves too. And so really, I think getting the parents more organized, uh, educated and organized about CP will be very helpful uh, in advocating uh, for it. I, I was surprised, you know, on my trip to Kenya to see uh, and hear from them about the uh, changes that have uh, occurred in the last 20 years, um, you know, that my colleague's been going there um, in terms of disability care. And that it started with some very vocal and dedicated parents who organized themselves and you know, have gone on to develop spina bifida associations and CP associations. So. Um, how, how involved and active is the um, you mentioned you're a secretary of the uh, Pediatric Orthopedic Society in India, and is there a cerebral palsy uh, subgroup there, or? No, we really don't have a subgroup, but we are in the process of developing the HIP surveillance guidelines for Indian population. Okay. We are towards the Delphi mm -hmm. uh, consensus building and forming performers for evolving a consensus using uh, data from the Australian and the uh, Canadian and the yeah. AIDS PDM. Mm -hmm. as well as uh, Scottish registry then so that we have our own uh, consensus and a pro forma for evaluating the hit course. Mm -hmm. Comprehensive CP care is still far away. No, that's great because it'll so, you know save yeah, a lot of problems start, there. Uh, saving the hit. So that yeah. is ongoing right now. Excellent. So we have uh, Dr. Kishore Bhulpuri from Canada who is leading that project and Dr. Johan so from India and the entire uh, Cozy group, we have about 20 people, including therapists and neurologists and uh, developmental medicine people contributing. So hopefully, in four to six months, we'll come out with Indian uh, guidelines for uh, hip surveillance for CP kids. That will be one step ahead. But, like you said, unless we get funding from insurance or more awareness in people that they are going to have to look after these children in a over their lifespan. Right. And uh, probably creating centers like, like here, we, we would look forward to collaboration where hopefully we can have
have some or evolve some program. But I feel listening to your lecture that this whole uh, work is uh, beyond the lifespan of one orthopedic surgeon. Well, you know, it's interesting. Probably, it's, it, yeah. You need to develop. Uh, you start, set the one orthopedic you surgeon set. Take, take it on. Yes, absolutely. So I think mentoring and uh, encouraging younger people to be interested in CP is going to be a bigger challenge. Right. And so I think. We die off with the person who was interested. Right. I <laughs> think. <laughs> I think that's a challenge that we face too. Because it's neither glamorous nor exciting nor rewarding because nobody gets better. Right. In that sense. Versus a joint replacement, which is no yes. more glamorous. <laughs> true, very true. Uh, but it's interesting because that's the same challenge that's there, you know, across the U.S. as well and across the world is finding people in the adult world who are interested in people with pediatric onset disabilities. And really, it is, if you look at it epidemiologically, then it is a growing problem because okay. more and but more people, yes, and we need to you know, come together and come up with a plan. And so one of the ways we were able to start this adult CP clinic, for example, was there was one resident who was kind of humming and annoying. What, what should I you know, do? What do I wanna do? And we started talking, she was coming to our PED CP clinic. She liked the population and it was basically mentoring and you know, she, she seemed interested in this population and so then focused on this population and started the clinic. And so I think that was sort of the start. Um, and similarly, it was, you know, in terms of research, it became very evident that this was a group that, uh, as a department, you know, where our chairman kind of made the commitment to this uh, so population as well. Is looking people like you to America. Well, many of us are wanting to come back in terms of collaboration. So <laughs> she came back, right? <laughs> You're pulling people back. Hopefully, then we can develop a program. There is such a big social problem. The main problem in this is. The second you start saying that you're going to have, you know, neonatal ICUs and pediatric ICUs, you're looking at a vaster number of people with cellular cost which ever to come. It, it boils down, I'm and telling you, it boils see, down to funding. As yeah. long, if, if, if we had a program which funded a person who works 8 hours, 10 hours in CP without looking at how many got cured and what is the income from that, and pay them equally well, why would people leave? Right. People have gone abroad, abroad in Lima pressure because for the same work, they have a reasonable lifestyle and a income. You know, I, 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 uh, there, there are more in the audience virtually, and I don't know if there's any questions from the audience, if there sure. are. Just yeah. ask questions. So that's interesting how it evolves. Yes. We are somewhere now closer to getting more awareness that CP can be treated to some what level to improve the ambulatory status and their participation in probably schooling and other things. I mean, I, I think a big uh, piece in terms of education is increasing the awareness that 50, you know, we talk about intellectual disability saying there's 50%, but that means there's 50% who are more normal yeah. in their intellectual I abilities. Yeah. Brain function, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. Other than the motor disability. And they have an innate kind of a different intelligence which allows them to survive better. Right. They are smarter, right? <laughs> That's interesting. In, uh, certainly, in terms of their will and motivation, yeah, they, they are. Around that, so that they survive. And the important thing, like you said, is that we have to stop thinking of uh, terms of in terms of a cure. It has to be care in the sense that. Uh, the PROM, the PROMs, the yep. patient uh, uh, um, reported, uh, outcomes. reported outcome measures are yes. going to be very important because you have to take the family's perspective into account before planning a treatment. Just because the hip is out doesn't mean I have to put it in. Right. If the expectation of the family is just keep him comfortable as it is a normal offer, they have FCS 5 or so. So it doesn't make sense to put them or subject them to extensive surgery. And cost, especially and cost, if that's when being they're paying out of pocket. Right. Doesn't expect anything out of that. But I think efforts uh, directed towards that same patient in bringing more joy to their yeah, life. So the spiritual be, as well as fine, uh, the school uh, and you know socialization. Social. Yep. I think that's where the efforts would need to be. In fact, now what's happening is. My CP kids have grown up to the age where they are marriageable, and the parents come and say, Do you have a CP girl? Because I have started becoming matrimonial. <laughs> now, that's an interesting service to provide. <laughs> so people come and say, Do you know any a matrimonial service? <laughs> so, 
Yeah, so what was interesting for us, the question was, um, you know, since we had noticed that there was attrition of uh, patients going from a pediatric world into, into adulthood, um, what, can we, what have we done or what have we learned in how to retain them? What we found is by starting the adult cerebral palsy clinic, we were able to, and by making sure that what we were addressing in the adult cerebral palsy clinic was geared towards what their needs were, um, I think that's where we started drawing them back. And those clinics have grown to where now we've hired a second person and, you know, um, the clinics are occurring more than yeah, once a week. Yes. Otherwise. And so we were able to draw them back into, um, you know, receiving care as well. And the uh, thing I want to, you know, also say is that there is a place for treatments for spasticity, even in the adult population. You know, this young man, for example, gets his botulinum toxin injections, he gets them once a year, and that seems about enough to, combined with the physical activity and other things he does to help maintain function for him. Uh, in terms of fairly support organizations, you know, which push the advocacy efforts mm -hmm. for multiple of the changes that you kind of suggested in adult care, uh, is is it more based out of the hospital? Do you have an active parent organization group where you will adopt every parent that comes in? No, we don't. We don't actually have that. There's um, through the cerebral the cerebral palsy alliance um, that they um, you know have a parent support group that people can get on. And then I find that there's a lot of our patients who end up on Facebook parent support groups um, as well. You have to be careful and kind of help guide them into the right kind of support group situation um, so that, you know, more evidence-based treatments are being uh, discussed and supported uh, is also important. Yeah, sometimes that's from the market. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Like some of the organizations like the Nord uh, will have links to parent support groups. So do you always also do that? Do you vet these yes. parent groups and then yes. kind of then advise them on yeah, which one to be part of. Yes, we do. We do. There's a question back there. Go ahead. Uh, most of the patients in the family has a doubt that in case of plastic cerebral palsy, so they want Botox or they are conservative to manage. So how do we decide that conservative management or Botox or surgery? Or specific for a hamstring muscle? So I think a big part of it is trying to determine what the goals are. Um, so you want to first find out, you know, is this person ambulatory, non-ambulatory? What are their goals? What are they hoping to achieve? Um, and I think that'll help determine. And then you also look at resources available. If they're having to pay out of pocket, you want to always try um, the less invasive or interventional procedure first um, and see if that's uh, effective. In certain situations, it may be more cost effective to jump to the uh, more involved uh, procedure first. So um, I think it depends on what you're um, dealing with. So if you have a hamstring muscle in terms of trying to see, is it is it spasticity you're trying to treat? If it's spasticity that you're trying to treat, then you may need to be using the botulinum toxin uh, to help reduce spasticity. But if there's contracture there, that's significant too. And you can tell that by how you're assessing with your TARDU scale, for example, looking at where the R1 and R2 is. Um, so your start catch and where your end range is, um, that'll help determine whether you're dealing with a contracture. And if you're dealing with a contracture, then it doesn't make sense to necessarily do botulinum toxin injections. You'd wanna go to the surgical intervention, or if you wanna try non-surgical, you know, you could try a dynamic splint or casting. I don't think it's gonna have an effect in that situation. You would probably do surgery. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Yep. 
Great. Well, thank you all. Thank you in the uh, virtual audience as well. And uh, thank you. I want to thank uh, Dr. Patwardhan, and Dr. Joshi and Saloni here for uh, the opportunity uh, to speak with you. And I want to thank you all in the audience as well for your participation. Thank you. <laughs> no, let me thank uh, Dr. Rita Inga for sparing her time and uh, really making it very clear to all of us that uh, comprehensive care also involves looking after them when they have become older and uh, they have gone beyond the scope of uh, surgical intervention in terms of care for their social, spiritual and emotional development as well. Because for most pediatric orthopedic surgeons, once they cross 16 and they are, okay, we say by 16, you grow up and either we make you GMFCS 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever, your ambulatory, non-ambulatory with support, without support, your hips are stable or no, and our job is done. And after that, uh, God will take care of you or your family, which doesn't happen because uh, they have nowhere else to go. Like, like I said, there is no adult CP, rehabilitation, palliation care comprehensive clinic or any such stuff. So probably it's a new area where uh, I think we should encourage our younger generations to put their attention into because the bludgeoning numbers are going to be really there. And uh, like you said, in India, the incidence is quite high, uh, about six to eight per thousand live births because of uh, the excitement of saving neonates in an ICU. And uh, more and more children with CP are there around us. The problem is reaching out to them because 70%, I guess, are in rural population and they practically don't have access. And compared to the Western world, it's cheaper to have another child in our country. So they would just ignore that child and have one more. And uh, so that is just left to fate. Uh, maybe they die off, maybe they're just left in one corner, very few. In urban population, probably because of uh, smaller families and more nuclear families, they would like to take care and uh, seek out treatment in a more aggressive fashion. Whereas in the rural population, there is no penetration of health services to that level uh, of uh, comprehensive or trained personnel or any kind of facility of rehabilitation or intervention, either by Botox or uh, in surgery at all. So it, uh, let us see how it evolves and uh, we look forward to collaboration with uh, people such as you who can uh, give back to probably your alma mater or city, wherever you come from. And uh, maybe POSI can take some lead in trying to set up uh, some kind of liaison to have some kind of a program where we can try to at least educate people about adult CP care through the website or through uh, digital media. So thank you very much, Ita. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.